I think I've chosen medicine because I really wanted to help people. And I think with intensive care is where we can help more, in my opinion. You can do some intervention and then you can see the result of this intervention some seconds and minutes after this. I'm a researcher now based in Brazil with main focus on mechanical ventilation and protective ventilation. And I work mainly with two groups. There is the ProveNet group that we develop research on mechanical ventilation, especially in lung protective ventilation in the OR and in the ICUs. And also with the BrickNet, there is the Brazilian Research in Intensive Care Network group and where we study more about general practice in the ICU and also mechanical ventilation. Yeah, there is no formal definition of lung protective ventilation, but I really think that the best definition is any strategy aiming to protect the lung in the first place, instead of just pushing air into it or just achieving adequate blood gases. I think that the most important component of this bundle called lung protective ventilation is that you should use low tidal volumes during your surgery. For sure, you should titrate your tidal volume to the predicted body weight calculated according to the size of the lung is related to the gender and related to the, to the height of the patient. So you should not never use the actual body weight as a way to titrate your tidal volume. I think that the decremental PIP trials and titration according to compliance are well understood. However, we have learned from EIT studies, the electrical impedance tomography, that sometimes the PIP that we find using electrical impedance is a bit different from the PIP that we find using compliance. With the EIT we can see the effect of the PIP in the lung. So I think that the EIT is a good strategy to select the correct level of PIP. I think in the surgical room specifically, we don't need higher levels of PIP. We should keep with the traditional lower level for the majority number of patients. Of course that when we have problems with compliance, when we have problems with hypoxemia, the increase in PIP levels and maybe recruitment maneuvers can also be used. The other components of, of the lung protective strategy of ventilation, for example, driving pressure is a very important marker of a wrong strategy of ventilation. So we should always try to achieve the lowest driving pressure possible using low tidal volumes and adequate levels of PIP. FiO2 is a, is a big question that we have. In the ICU, we have the answer. For sure, we should use lower uh, FiO2 or the lowest FiO2 possible to have an adequate uh, oxygenation. In the OR, we have more discussion. My personal view is that we should always aim to the lowest FiO2 possible to achieve an adequate gas exchange in this case. For sure, the history of protective ventilation starts in the OR. And we learned from the operating room, from the anesthesiologists, that we should use higher tidal volumes because patients with higher tidal volumes usually develop less hypoxemia in the post-operative period. This is, nine, this is 1960, 1961. Then we started to learn in the ICU that we should use lower tidal volumes to protect the lungs. And then now we are trying to put this idea of low tidal volumes back to the OR. Well, we started to look for lung protective ventilation in the OR after the, the publication of some papers from, I think, 2009, 2010, where we learned that lung protective could also benefit patients without ARDS. So this was like a, a mind blowing for me. And the best way to study patients without ARDS is to study surgical patients, where we can really understand the harmful effects of mechanical ventilation. So this is why we moved a bit from intensive care to operating room. Uh, unfortunately, we did not achieve yet the perfect strategy of ventilation in the OR to improve uh, uh, the outcome of these patients. Because first, it took some time to get the information from the evidence, from the literature, and put in practice. So, uh, from Las Vegas, it's a very large observational study. We have learned that the anesthesiologists still use the default settings of the ventilation. 
So usually they use 500 ml of tidal volume, sometimes zero of PEEP. So information is very important to teach anesthesiologists how to ventilate patients. And the second point is that usually anesthesiologists think that since a procedure is very short, there is no problem with the mechanical ventilation, and this is not true. I have an example of a thoracic surgical, pa surgical patient where we received the patient in the ICU after a, a thoracic surgery, and two days after the surgery he developed a, a, a lung injury, an ARDS, but the strange point was that it was only in one lung. And then we discovered from the OR that the patient received one lung ventilation and the tidal volumes and the PEEP were inadequate for that lung. And probably this was the cause of the lung injury in this patient. So this is an example on how even short periods of mechanical ventilation can harm the lungs. I think that if I would suggest some practical guidance, I would start from the pre-operative period, where I think that we should stratify our patients according to the risk of complications. Then in the intraoperative period, you should calculate the predicted body weight and then to titrate the tidal volume. Then you should keep a, an adequate level of PEEP and then you can save higher levels of PEEP and recruitment maneuvers for, as a rescue strategies. And then in the post-operative period, you have the general care that we should use, but it's specifically about ventilation. Uh, for sure, I think all patients could benefit from lung protective ventilation, not only patients with injured lungs, any type of patients, obese, non-obese, elderly, no elderly. It's a very easy strategy that it could be easily implemented in any place, in any country, with any, any type of, of surgery or any type of patient in the ICU. I think that for sure we should spread the message of lung protective ventilation in the OR and also in the ICU. We have a lot of papers about it uh, and I think that the best way to spread this message, message is through the meetings, the congress, the symposiums with formative videos. I think that we don't have a specific website talking about protective ventilation, but for example, the use of low tidal volume is already part of the EROS protocol. This is a way to spread this, this message and show the importance of lung protective ventilation. I think the most important tool is a good ventilator. A ventilator that you can trust, where you can see the settings and you can trust that that setting is really through. For sure, the lung protective ventilation can decrease cost for the hospitals because you decrease the number of complications and you decrease the hospital length of stay and you decrease the need of resources. No, I think that lung protective ventilation is not a hype. It's something that is here to stay because we are just trying to achieve again our physiology with the use of protective ventilation.